the most famous scene in Jane Austen's Persuasion takes place on this big long jetty that juts way out to sea along the coast of England. This is where Louisa Musgrove takes her over hasty leap and injures herself. And it's kind of remarkable how iconic this spot is. I mean, maybe not quite as iconic as the opening lines of uh, Pride and Prejudice, but I think it's interesting that the icon of persuasion is a, is a place, an actual place, whereas that of uh, Pride and Prejudice's text. Persuasion has a concern for what is left out of language, even more in a more radical way, the a concern for the body, the, you know, the vulnerability of the body, and a concern for geography, the sea, the contrast between sea and land, the new economy and social um, reality, global cl- capitalism, as well as war, that uh, the sea represents in contrast to the age-old feudal social structures of, of the land. Transitional point between the land and the sea, the, this cob is a um, perfect uh, symbol for Jane Austen, also the, 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 the symbolism of the, the leap, falling in love, but also the um, unpredictability of life. This concern with unpredictability, I think, is a strikingly modern um, aspect of this novel, and it, like its um, concern for globalism. I think they both have to do with mobility, you know, a new sense of mobility, complex social interaction on a, a whole new scale. Austin really affirms the, the mobility of the novel itself as a means of global communication and uh, global community and mobility. The uh, novel's last um, sentence is written in the present tense, referring to the Navy, the place of the military and um, society, and also in the family, uh, reorganizing the family. In addition to all the autobiographical details that I'll get into, um, this book is really reaching out and d- directly addressing, and in as well as intervening in wanting to contribute to and be a part of emergent social and economic realities. In terms of the theme of uh, mobility, I just want to show you a cool scene. It's a sort of updated use of the cob. It's a shot also there, this movie, The French Lieutenant's Woman. Um, probably bears some interesting comparison to, to persuasion, but the uh, protagonist here is more of a femme fatale character that we get to see and I, I think a really classic classic shot of uh, cinema right here so for a little opening entertainment here you go Persuasion was not um, titled by Jane Austen. It's not her title. Um, it was published after she died, and um, her bro- brother titled it, um, which I find interesting to know because um, she uses the word, variants of the word persuasion so often in the book that you get the feel, or I had the feeling that like she's trying to use it because it's the title. So it's sort of interesting to realize that she hadn't even intended it as the title as far as we know. But it still sort of serves a function of like pride and prejudice in that novel. It's a key term in the text that she's kind of interrogating. So this is another Jane Austen Cinderella story, basically. Um, you know, oddball daughters struggling with uh, economic and class dynamics and gender dynamics of the time, uh, but ultimately getting 
rescued by Prince Charming. But, you know, Jane Austen's documenting this, kind of the decline of this very ornate aristocratic class. Jane Austen is really close to the subject she's writing about. You know, I think that just defines a Jane Austen heroine, is that she's precisely somebody that would read Jane Austen novels. So she's very close to her audience in that sense. That I think also accounts for the realism of um, especially persuasion. There's so many references to her own life. In fact, the characters Anne and uh, Lady Russell in Persuasion, two different characters each represent uh, important experiences for Austen, of, of Austen's own. One was having to go to stay in Bath, although she didn't want to, um, for because of um, family finances. And um, the other was that she played the role of uh, Lady Russell in um, persuading her niece uh, against marriage. So these are details of the plot that she was, you know, basically writing directly from her own life. In a more general way, the effects of the war, her sister's fiance died in the war, um, and the effects of disinheritance she um, felt really acutely as, as she was um, suffering from the illness uh, that killed her. You know, she died at 41. Final work she did on uh, persuasion, she did while she was ill. It's amazing, to, you know, to think of terminal illness as the backdrop to uh, Austin's writing here and Keats's writing. So while I think there's a lot of really sharp um, social critique in Pride and Prejudice, um, the critique stays on, the, on a kind of abstract level. Whereas persuasion, I think you get a much more direct, personal, and all, as I've been emphasizing, embodied uh, perspective on it. I mean, it's the the fact of aging uh, for uh, Anne as an old woman of twenty eight. Uh, bodily effects of uh, experience are very real in persuasion, relatively speaking. Costs of war and the costs of family for women. Uh, persuasion evokes a really vivid sense of work, the labor of um, family for, for women as caretakers and, you know, just getting moved around because of uh, the male pecking order and uh, is extremely confining in a way that it's left abstract in um, Pride and Prejudice. We get the feeling like, oh, hanging out with the Bennets would just be super tedious, that you don't feel like it's exhausting and kind of scary the way uh, Anne's predicament and persuasion feels. Indeed, Anne is traumatized, and this trauma is registered right at the beginning. The story of the lost mother and uh, stillborn son are just unaddressed. It's just this um, huge unspoken uh, wound. And I mean, not just unspoken, but weirdly, you know, actively repressed because it just seems like it's so out in the open, but it's something nobody dares mention. I mean, just the, just the fact that, um, you know, the comic element here is that Sir Walter Elliot loves to read this so much. He finds occupation for an idle hour and consolation in a distressed one. This is like the center of his world. It's like, you know, it's like therapy for him. To, but he even ad amended the exact date of her death. He added it in there. It seems a little like a weird thing to just, you know, be fetishizing for the glory of being a baron baronet with this painful story right there staring you in the face. So a big part of the project of the novel Persuasion is to make the violence, the systemic violence of um, patriarchy and the kind of feudal class system that's staring everyone in the face it's kind of out in the open but no one's acknowledging to make it to acknowledge it to make it readable that's um sort of the theme that i've been trying to trace in this 
class is making bodies, making body experience, embodied experience legible, readable, um, put it into circulation, give it recognition in the um, currency of language and in particular the currency of the novel. I mentioned that um, Anne and Lady Elliot represent two different sides of uh, Austen's character, but it's really Anne who's Austen's surrogate. This has to do, I think, most importantly, difference in class relations in, in persuasion uh, relative to um, Pride and Prejudice. There is no Darcy. There is no um, noble version of, of Prince Charming. On the contrary, it's a, the um, aristocracy and persuasion is portrayed as um, leech-like, if not actually predatory. Not only are there no Darcys, but it's it's as if the aristocracy and persuasion were populated with Mr. Collins's, Mr. Collins's and uh, Miss Bingley's parasites who just just live for the sake of this performance of their own class superiority. Anne's predicament is laid out pretty bluntly. <laughs> a few years before, Anne Elliot had been a very pretty girl, but her bloom had vanished early, and as even in its height, her father found little to admire in her, so totally different was her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own. There could be nothing in them now that she was faded and thin to excite his, his esteem. So he's kind of a Frankenstein figure, like he's so, he's so ridiculously narcissistic. He had never indulged much hope, he now had none, of ever reading her name in any other page of his favorite work. Also, like Dr. Frankenstein, um, Walter treats Anne, you know, like a doormat, um, like a thing, like wasted trash that's lost its value and that her social currency she's uh it's not just walter but other people exploit her as well to just you know presume to to take her time so this totally voiceless woman to sort of get, continue building on the uh, analogy to frankenstein you know she's like the ostracized women in that book the women on the periphery of the interlaced male nar narratives in that book. Anne Elliot is kind of an outsider. She's just kind of pushed around. But she had in her past the most amazing romance. This is what's amazing about this narrative is it's so abstract. We don't hear any details about the romance. We just hear precisely that it was an amazing romance. <laughs> I love that sort of nakedness that um, we've seen that before in Jane Austen, where it's, I feel like she's winking at the reader a little bit, it effectively saying, just imagine the happiest couple ever. That was them. <laughs> she's toying with the romance um, convention and our susceptibility to it, you know. There's a, you know, enjoyment of going through the motions of a um, Cinderella plot. Um, and she uh, winks in a knowing way at the reader. There's also a kind of romantic poetics to this. I mentioned that this is considered her work most influenced by um, romantic poetry. You can really see some elements already in this narrative. You can see sort of a think haunting echo of we are seven this kind of failure to count people and i think again this it, that isn't a bad comparison either in terms of anne that she's silenced like the girl um but the other side of anne is that she has this kind of fairy tale background um so this is her character is laid, laid out kind of schematically like you know lucy <laughs> This sort of fairy tale, but also, you know, of, of pain too. She's traumatized, it's haunting. But her backstory is, is enchanting. So like those pre-Raphaelite paintings, Austin knows that she's working with tropes and conventions. So when she tells us this backstory, it's very clear she's just doing that outline. She's not individuating the story, really. And, you know, there's a kind of psychological realism even to that in terms of the, you know, memories of youth. 
maybe kind of blur. It sort of, I get that feeling with Anne's. This is sort of a whirlwind that, you know, this first love Austin uses the fairy tale expectations of romance to throw in critical relief the actual shortcomings of the institution of marriage of, at the time. And I, the, I think looking at it this way is it really makes a difference for in terms of how we understand the, um, you know, critical function of reading, our in, very enjoyment of the fairy tale romance convention. That's being leveraged in a critical way um, for shedding a, a critical eye on social reality. Pl the pleasure in the um, fairy tale romance is actually mobilizing a critical intelligence. Um, we enjoy the romantic fairy tale, but that enjoyment is also serving to offer us a lot of instruction and insight into um, hard um, realities of married life, and domestic life uh, in general. This marriage market is the reality of it is uh, made very um, palpable. Um, it's not just evil, ugly stepsisters and so on that um, Anne is trying to escape like uh, Cinderella. Um, but it's a, you know, it's our actual world. Um, it basically glosses over Anne and Frederick's uh, early blissful first romance uh, with the sentence, a short period of exquisite felicity followed and but a short one. Troubles soon arose. So bliss, romance, are not to be narrated. They're to be imagined in, you know, Keats's terms and negative capability, not to be spelled out in terms of uh, a, a narrative of actual, you know, events and causality and detail. The um, novel Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy begins with the famous lines that all happy families are alike. Unhappy families are each unhappy in their own way. For As far as na narrative is concerned, happiness is boring. Um, happiness is interesting to imagine, but to uh, tell the story of, not so much. Um, narratives are good for detailing the troubles, uh, the complexities of life mobilizing our critical attention, our analytical attention to those. And here the troubles are um, Walter and Lady Elliot's uh, snobbism. The persuasiveness of Walter and Lady Russell here is quite blunt and violent. Um, so Walter doesn't even respond. He um, prohibits, uh, effectively prohibits without saying anything. Um, it's really brutal how he shuts her down and leaves her to interpret his silence. Um, again, he, this is a haunting echo of Darcy's, um, uh, the, the uh, compelling, persuasive uh, power of um, Darcy's silent body, just, you know, by speaking um, saying nothing, he, he, the power of his uh, body alone um, as a social force. Likewise, Sir Walter, um, but this is uh, the opposite of uh, edifying. It's um, just um, a violent, you know, shutting down of, of Anne. Sir Walter, I'm being applied to without actually withholding his consent or saying it should never be, gave it all the negative of great astonishment, great coldness, great silence, and a professed resolution of doing nothing for his daughter. Now, what about Lady Russell? I think it's interesting how precisely uh, Austen um, distinguishes her lack of consent from Walters. Lady Russell, she's all about like euphemism. She disguises, basically she's allied with um, Sir Walter, but she packages her resistance and disapproval in a more tempered 
and pardonable pride. And she refers to it as a, a most unfortunate alliance. Austin there is, is just indicate this tempering and pardoning as I think <laughs> euphemisms for euphemism. And there's quite a bit of passive aggressiveness, but she kind of um, is the rationalizes, um, you know, what Sir Walter for him says. She tempers his patriarchal uh, course of power. In other words, she, I think this tempering is kind of like comparable to a kind of Frankenstein family engineering. It, it, it's it's. Lady Russell that's really exercising uh, the engineering, the mediating through this tempering uh, mechanics of uh, family. In a way, Sir Walter is just too aloof. So notice free and direct discourse in the next paragraph. Channeling Lady Russell's argument, um, it's, I think, pretty interesting. Because, in a, so what we're seeing here is how you know, brutally, Anne Elliot is getting pushed around, how indifferently and without acknowledgement. And yet in this uh, free and direct discourse of uh, Lady Russell's, it's as if Anne Elliot is being put on a pedestal and so much concern about her lavish claims of birth and beauty and mind. She's too cherished to um, be thrown away on, on Frederick. She's, she's getting pigeonholed and controlled both ways. You know, she's getting disregarded, but then um, as this treasure that can't be wasted. Anne Elliot, so young, known to so few, to be snatched off by a stranger without alliance or fortune, or rather sunk by him into a state of um, most wearing, anxious, youth-killing dependence. It must not be. If any fair interference of friendship... Okay, the, more um, interesting euphemisms. Interference of friendship. Is it about friendship? Is that a, an interference a friend c even could make? Any representations of one who had almost a mother's love and mother's rights, it would be prevented. So Lady Russell is leveraging a claim to stand in for the mother uh, she's leveraging the mother's memory, her authority, the authority of the dead. So that's a very blunt form of persuasion the novel is exploring. But going back to the point about Austin's proximity to the subject matter, the experiences she describes, persuasion is also what the novel does. <laughs> the novel is another mode of persuasion, a mode of resisting, reframing, flipping the script on the aristocracy. I don't exactly mean flipping the script because it's not about inverting the plot and vanquishing the aristocracy rather than the other way around. It's more about just escaping the chokehold of the aristocracy and uh, finding a community, a, a voice for communicating experience. Far from a, you know, just being a passive Cinderella, she learns to read and reframe her story acknowledging this new reality in a mobile medium. I mean, the novel travels and the, the novel it represents a kind of uprooted home, like the sailors are uprooted, nomadic. And um, that's Anne's fate, and I think it's our fate as readers, too.